Here you are. You. Welcome, Christoph. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you for the introduction. And you have uh, half an hour for that. Oh, well, that's to talk about the million. Euros. Oh, why? Wow. So, half a minute. had I known that, I would have packed in even more slides in the presentation. Thanks a lot for, invita for the invitation, for the introduction. Thank you for, to Per, to Jens, and Nicholas, and the rest of the Velox team for inviting me here, uh, for finding us another great space together, and giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, it seems like this uh, forum has become an opportunity for me every uh, two years to speak to my um, European colleagues in, the, colleagues in the field of daylighting. And so I looked through all the projects that we've been working on in the last two years, and I picked two and I combined them under the title Daylighting the Millennials. And uh, the base idea and approach behind of this is, of course, what we heard before, that uh, our working habits are changing. And we feel that certainly into the millennials, that are currently studying at MIT and elsewhere in the world, when we actually look at occupancy rates in libraries, they're lower than they've been before. In labs, they're still coming to class, if class is good. Uh, and uh, where are they instead? Well, they're still working. I would say productivity in the research level has been higher than it has ever been before. But due to modern technologies, you see here two of our students, they can work anywhere, right? So uh, sitting in uh, cafes, um, uh, drinking herbal tea or coffee, and we put a blue light in here to just see that there are different ways of keeping yourself awake and alert. This is what they do. And uh, in order to understand this trends a little better and what this might mean for daylighting, um, I'm asking three questions, or I'm covering three questions here in the following. And the first one is really related to this age-old question, outside environmental conditions. We know when the weather is good, the students and the workforce is increasingly outside. So how well do we understand, actually, the relationship between outside conditions and people being outside? It's kind of the ultimate act of daylighting, right? Uh, what are the potential impacts on productivity when you're outside working on your electronic surfaces? How well can you actually see the surfaces and read on them? And what do we learn from all of this, trying to fold this back into architectural design? So uh, we did a little photo series and uh, to kind of go back in time, see how we uh, designed for daylighting and then how uh, we might be uh, starting to design going forward. And if Jamie, architect Jamie here, would have worked maybe in the 1950s with a nice tie uh, and his work uh, habit, he would have worked, of course, on a horizontal surface, had uh, plenty of daylight coming in at the side. And he would have maybe dreamt or worked on using the old-fashioned wall drum diagram or the BRS protractor methods to predict how much light we have in spaces. And then uh, the workspace fortunately became more colorful, more diverse. Uh, instead of the horizontal surface, we have vertical surfaces. At that moment, we had to uh, limit the light coming in spaces with different types of shading devices. And again, these two architects in the late uh, 1990s or early 2000s, Jamie would have discovered Equitect. Isn't that so cool? We can digitally do the same that we did before by hand. And Alpha would probably have told, shown him, well, I found this cool tool. We can do parametric design right now. So instead of looking at one design, we can look at 10,000 designs. And we can combine that with an al algorithm, genetic algorithm, to find us the best solution possible. And then, since we had these new uh, computational capabilities, we started to expand and say, well, let's not only look at daylight availability, let's get more serious about doing an integrated type of analysis, energy, daylighting, and comfort at the same time. And uh, for energy, we could look at loads, at costs, at carbon emissions, and of course, at glare and view for comfort. And I think daylighting research is just getting started. Right now, we have this increasingly complex amount of metrics that we have to look at. And Marilyn is going to introduce some of the new metrics, health potential, visual interest, gaze, going forward. So there are all of these things that are demanded for spaces from designers. And if you attended the virtual reality session, we now have uh, new technologies in place where we try to help designers and clients to understand all of these different influences on a building design. So I think uh, this, the outlook is pretty positive here. Uh, we can create pretty um, 
interesting facades that work. This is, I'm picking this, this is the Koch Institute for Cancer Research at MIT. It has an external light shelf, has an internal light shelf, has a shading system. And when you do an analysis of the space and just visit it, it's pretty evenly daylit and uh, most of the year, and it maintains views to the outside. So a space like this works, but the picture is kind of a symbol for the talk. Nobody's in the building often. So where are people instead? So if you just walk outside and it's a nice day, you see effectively everybody walking and working outside. So this leads me really into this new project that we started one and a half years ago, trying to understand better this relationship, outside conditions and when people are there. So if we're zooming out of the MIT campus, this is the MIT North Court. This is actually a great space to study because we have two public cafeterias there. One is the Stator Center from Geary. The other is the Coke Cafeteria. And outside, we have a whole set of uh, benches where people can work on. Some of the benches are shaded and some are exposed. So it's basically a perfect little field study where we can see, do you want to be inside or outside? And this is a major walk through the MIT campus as well. So we try to figure out how do we collect the information of people moving in that space, of lots and lots of people. And we tried and thought about different things, doing image recognitions with cameras and so forth. And what we came down to is we started to collaborate with this company here, which is called SUFA. Uh, this is uh, the CEO of SUFA, Sandra Richter, with President Obama doing the mic affair. And what this bench is, it's a solar-powered bench where you can charge your iPhone. But what these benches, which are supposed to be uh, deployed by cities, uh, do, they also collect all kinds of environmental information. And um, at this point in the presentation, I had a little more information because I shared this project with a few people yesterday, and I know there's a huge concern when it comes to data privacy, especially in Europe. So let's look at the technology a little bit. What does a Wi-Fi scanner do? So a Wi-Fi scanner basically can see uh, what the MAC address of your phone is. So if you have Wi-Fi enabled on your phone, your phone is constantly screaming, I'm a phone and my name is, and it gives its name, which is a long number combination. This number combination is not in any database, but this is how the phone is recognized effectively. So what we've done after a lot of going back and forth with MIT, we collected basically this information for the space. Uh, but first, we uh, converted the MAC ID into an encrypted ID. And we uh, were allowed to keep this for a year. And we wanted to understand what do we learn from this type of information. So for that, we then placed three sofa benches in the North Court, and we have the weather station to get the environmental conditions right as well. So this is the result from last July to November 2016. If you've been to Boston in December, it starts getting cold and nasty, so we started to stop our measurement <laughs> campaign then, and we are picking up now in March. So what did we do? When we started off on the far um, left-hand side, we started off with 12 million Wi-Fi probes, and after doing a little bit of cleaning up, we ended up with 6 million data probes, and then we threw out the weekend ones because we wanted to focus on the weekdays. That gave us 4.5 million probes. That's the kind of information that a router would collect. So a lot of uh, universities, well, I'm not sure a lot here, in the US universities keep the total number of uh, Wi-Fi probes connected to a router um, over time, and you can use this for research. So this is as far as you could usually go. Now, since we have the MAC IDs, we can go a lot further. We can basically understand that there are a lot of, we call them lurking Wi-Fi devices, which are arbitrary pieces that are on and off that might be a sprinkler system, and we threw that out. And then we have 180,000 visitors to the space. So we know there were 180,000 people coming, but less than 10 days. And we treat them separately. And then we have the regulars. And we can even tell which of the regulars are staff that are there during the summer and fall, and which are the students. So we actually get quite a lot of information out of this. So then the next part is looking at the environmental conditions. So here you see the north court from above. And there has been a lot of work over 18, 19 years, really, coming up with good thermal comfort indices. And one this is particularly, that is particularly promising is called the Universal Thermal Climate Index. 
And what it is, it's similar to what you would use in weather, uh, weather forecasts when somebody says it's this temperature with the wind. It takes all kinds of conditions into account. Long wavelength radiation, short wavelength radiation, the wind distribution, relative humidity, all of this. So it's a big uh, simulation feast that you have to follow there. But once you do that, you convert that into, equivalent, into an equivalent temperature, and depending on what range it is, it's supposed to tell you how comfortable you feel. So when we do this type of analysis here, we're using a tool in this case called EnviMet, where basically the simulation takes as long as real time. So it takes a day to calculate a day, and we needed a server uh, to do that. So here you see the results out of this. Basically, the colors indicate for every hour of a day, we did that for four months, uh, for every five meter block on the North Court, how people are going to feel when they are comfortable or not, according to this method. Now, this method was developed with only a few people at a time, a maximum of 100 people for a study. And we wanted to see how this would link to over 200,000 people. And here are the results, which are pretty compelling, I find. So if you look at it, you see on the x-axis the predictions of how comfortable people are. We call this the preferred UTCI. So if you remember these benches, some of the benches were in the shadow and some were, under, uh, were exposed. So we assume that people are clever enough to pick the better bench for lunch, for example. So basically the best position at all time, and we wanted to see how does this link to uh, how many people are outside. And the cor correlation right now is quite stunning. We got the 90% correlation. That means that we can use these tools for urban planning. Basically, what we, of course, want to do is we want to create outdoor conditions that are benign longer. The equivalent would be what happens in the Netherlands when you are there having a, a cafe with glass around it to shield people from the wind, these type of concepts, effectively. So this works pretty well. The correlation is stronger for the regulars than for the visitors because the visitors don't really have a choice. What they come to MIT is not that they're leaving because the weather is bad. We wouldn't get a lot of visitors in that case. Uh, if we are zooming in a little more, so here we went one step further. We basically looked at days when, uh, with the MAC ID, we found that somebody was at all at MIT, and then we wanted to see the probability that they were also having lunch. And if you look at it, you basically see that for the particular space in the North Court, the probability doubles that people in good weather go there. So if you think about your, uh, your Starbucks and you want to place your next cafe, obviously you want to have conditions where the outside conditions are positive so that people come. Now this is my favorite graph today. This shows you how long people at MIT take lunch. So if the weather condition isn't very great, we are taking lunch for eight minutes. And when it's really super, our lunch extends to 10 minutes. <laughs> so it would be interesting if we did that same study in other parts of the world. It's a little insane, but I guess that's who we are. Um, so now we are happy as clams, and we are working outside at Sufa benches and elsewhere on electronic surfaces. And we really wanted to see uh, all of us probably have been in the situation where we desperately on a day let day try to see what is on our phone. And we of course take more and more of information through these devices. So just to get a sense here, how many people read their news on electronic surfaces exclusively? Well, it's a good number. I thought, I was afraid that this would be a problem that is totally non-existent here. Yes, uh, so um, we have this little study that we call how to read the New York Times. And basically, do you want to read it on paper? Do you want to read it on an iPad? And the study uh, is basically set up in daily spaces. We have people for half an hour reading on both type of devices. And we're doing all kinds of tests. And this is how the setup works effectively. So we have this uh, device called an iPad, which uh, you can adjust however you want within a daily condition. And we are keeping track of how you adjust it. And then you do a series of reading and image recognition tests. And on the right-hand side, you see we use the camera of the iPad to track where your head is so that we can get a complete glare model of where is the sun, how do you hold the iPad, and where's your head, effectively. That's the idea behind that. So we just started with that. So far, we've had five people actually uh, trying it out, see that the technology works. It's pretty clear that you read better in daylight conditions on paper than on an iPad, and that especially image uh, recognition or image um, comparisons tend to be a lot better there. That's, of course, why products such as iInc have been developed, even though not that many people use it right now. 
So I think this is interesting, which also just shows why the iPad is very seductive to use, right? Because we have a whole library in our hand that we might have some compromises where it's good if we actually work on these tools. So and now I wanted to come back really, how, what does all of this mean actually? How do we now provide the daylight to the millennials? What would be a master plan? And so I presented this concept before two years ago that we are increasingly doing daylighting analysis of whole neighborhoods. We have tools for this now that can run. This is a neighborhood proposal for Kuwait City. We can effectively run daylight autonomy annual calculation in half an hour for a whole neighborhood. And what we would propose is that you combine this type of analysis now with, um, with an outside thermal comfort analysis so that you know when in the year you also know how people are being comfortable. And so the goal would be that you have this kind of integrated designs, right? Such as what you see here, that you try to have livable spaces that connect with the outside in meaningful ways and that we try to keep it as comfortable in the Middle East also during the spring and fall months as we can possibly do. And then going back to buildings, skylights, roofing tops, we still need them. Obviously, we just learned in the presentation before that there's a big desire and need for very adaptable large spaces. Now, the good news, of course, is that for skylights, we only need to cover between 2% and 5% of the roof area to have daylight throughout the um, room just below the daylight, just below the roof. And there's this natural synergy, of course, this kind of a little cheesy image between the skylight and the PV around it. So that's no problem. We've seen the synergies for a long time. But I want to introduce very quickly, because I'm running out of time, this notion going back to greenhouses, but in this time, actually for plants. So this is a growing trend, especially in the Northeast, uh, in the US, you hear that a lot. This is an example of a hydroponic system from Gotham Greens. So we just completed a study trying to understand, well, is this a good idea? And first, from a carbon standpoint, it turns out it is a very good idea, actually, because of the food miles and the amount of water being used uh, for our current agricultural system. Growing food on rooftops makes in the cities that you see here, Lisbon, Paris, Singapore, and New York, a lot of sense. In New York, we found you could even grow greenhouses in the basement without any daylight using LEDs. That's better than what we currently do. So that's a paradigm shift. And so I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of that. How much food can we actually grow? So uh, for Lisbon, we, did a st uh, we calculated that you need about eight square meters to grow enough food, the seven main vegetable groups, for a citizen for a whole year. And then we looked in the GIS model. We identified all the roof areas that have no land use. And we could cover more than 100% of the food needs of, uh, in uh, Lisbon this way. So this is something that we're certainly going to see a lot more. So this is, this, where is this going to end up with then? Well, it could be a battle for photons, right? Do we have the PV on the roof or the greenhouse or the skylights? Or more maybe a peaceful coexistence? Um, I think the left-hand side might be more realistic in larger new developments. Uh, and you can do some very interesting trade-off analysis, such as how many jobs do you create with the greenhouses? Is it not better if we create the food locally and have the PV somewhere else and just move the electricity in? So it's interesting discussions to be had. Some final thoughts. Well, uh, obviously, daylighting remains a vital component for the design of resource-efficient, healthful neighborhoods. That's not going to change. Uh, I think for the daylighting itself, we have the same trend as for the energy. For energy, it's really not enough anymore to make a low energy house somewhere, but we have to see how that house fits into the electric grid. Smart loads have to be connected with the grid. And for uh, daylighting, you can see a similar trend, right? Where effectively you say, if it's a very dense neighborhood, we need a lot of top lighting to provide all the daylight that the people get in the building. If there's lots of space and parks outside, maybe there's less pressure on doing that in the same way. And from a tool perspective, because we are all about the tools, my prediction is we will have three levels of tools. We will have this urban planning tools, the current generation of individual building level tools. But I think the next one is the live smartphone app. If you have an Apple II watch, that already tells me once an hour to get up and to breathe, uh, then I think the next step is it's also going to tell me I should go outside. The weather is great. The UTCI 
is fantastic and your favorite bench is unoccupied right now. <laughs> so that might be the future with that. I thank you.